What's going on, guilty guys and gals, and welcome to this video that I teased last week. <laughs> or a number of days ago, depending on how long it is that you're watching this. Um, so, this video might not be exactly what you're expecting, but I'm open to expanding on the prospect of it um, afterwards if people are interested. What I want to do in this video is talk about how the hit list targets in Ultra Despair Girls and the general plot of Ultra Despair Girls strangely mirrors the plot of V3 and its characters, and it might actually go to explain why V3 feels so off, why things seem to come out of nowhere sometimes, and why it doesn't feel exactly like a Danganronpa game we're used to. So yeah, let's get into it with the characters. So, our protagonist may not be the best one to start out with, because it doesn't exactly outline what I'm talking about here, but Kaede and Kamaru do share a lot of similar traits. For one, they're both hopeful right out of the gate. Um, Kamaru's hope is shattered very quickly by the army of Monokumas. However, if this was a regular killing game, it seems likely that she would act somewhat like Kaede. Um, they're both naive, obviously, about what's going on in the world. Um, that's maybe one of their strongest shared character traits. Um, they just want everybody to be safe. They're both female protagonists, the only ones we've had in Danganronpa. Um, Kaede's talent as a pianist always seemed out of left field. Like, okay, <laughs> that's kind of odd. Like, you can't just do the lucky student again, right? But at the same time, it feels like it could have been anything, and yet it was, like, pianist? And I think that's just because if this was originally a script that featured Komaru, she wouldn't have had a talent, so they needed something that would correlate, like, absolutely 0% with the killing game and all that goes with it, so Pianist was a, a natural choice. And then finally, the thing that's kind of odd about Kaede is that she's actually kind of, <laughs> she's actually kind of judgmental when she meets new people, like when she's talking about Samugi, um, when she first meets her, I, that's the one I remember the most, but I know she says things like... <laughs> Kind of weird, and Shuichi's like, whoa, Kaede, calm down. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, in this actual, like, proposed original Danganronpa 3 type thing, where the hitless targets would actually be the killing game instead of the V3 characters, I do not think that Komaru would die in Chapter 1. We'll get to that soon. Um, but... It seems likely she would have been the protagonist, which is why she is the protagonist in Ultra Despair Girls. And she even has like a fake out <laughs> execution in that game too. So, you know, foreshadowing. The next one I want to talk about is maybe the second most important character in both games, um, which are the similarities between Maki and Toko. Uh, I didn't really think about this at the time, but the more I thought about it, yeah, they're basically kind of the same character arc. Um, <laughs> They both don't want anything to do with the group, and then slowly through their friendship with the main character, and Kaido in this case, uh, <laughs> they slowly open up and become... Their character arc basically results in them earning their first friend. Um, but, to actually get to the points I put down, yes, they're both killers. Um, Maki is an assassin, and her assassinness is brought out in chapter two by Kokichi, which always felt weird to me. Like, how did he know that? <laughs> did he just like read her mind? I guess, I think the actual in-game explanation is that he watched all the motive videos. And so Maki's motive video would have called her ultimate assassin because that's her actual talent. However, <laughs> when we get to the Kokichi replacement, I want to say why it would make more sense this other way. Um, but, Yes, they're both shy and evade the group. They both have double identities. Of course, Toko's is much more severe than Maki's, but still. Um, their character arc we already talked about, and the group doesn't trust them because they're a killer. Seems pretty obvious. Also, they're like second... Their second-in-command placement in the sort of story structure makes a lot more sense um, in Ultra Despair Girls than it really does for Maki. Because Maki doesn't have, like, a pre-established character. Um, if 
it was Toko in her place, and we were seeing Toko come into her own almost. It, it would almost feel less kind of forced that Maki is like this super important character that does all these things. Anyway, next on the list is Sumugi and Nagito. Now, I wanted to talk about this fairly early on because Sumugi is the mastermind, of course, in V3. However, she doesn't really feel like the mastermind. And part of that is because her character throughout the entire game up to this point was absolutely nothing. <laughs> she didn't get to really show off anything. She gave no hints. It was basically down to the fact that, well, it has to be a girl. And we know it probably isn't Himiko and Maki, so I guess it's you, Samugi. <laughs> Um, so her sudden personality change is very jarring and makes it, I guess that might be intentional, but for someone like Nagito who does this in the first case in Danganronpa 2, it feels more justified because it's A, the first case, and <laughs> B, because he actually does something in that first case to cause a murder. Like, Samugi does a murder, but we don't... F it's so far removed from what we're doing right now, it feels less important. So, if Nagito, the servant, was one of the Killing Game members, which I came to as a conclusion because there were only 15 people <laughs> in my uh, original set with all the characters from uh, the Hit List, plus Komaru, plus Toko, plus Haiji, plus Nagito, minus... Kame Kameko? I think Kameko? The stink bug. The stink bug can't be a character. I'm stretching it already by including the cat, but the stink bug simply can't be a character. So I think just like in Ultra Despair Girls, they would totally discount the fact that Toko's got this emotional connection with this stink bug, and Toko would basically take her place after um, Byakuya is held captive. Um, so Nagito would also be a part of the killing game. He'd be one of the two ultimate, actual ultimate students that the group would encounter, and it would be kind of like a weird, refreshing thing, because it'd be like, oh, right, Nagito hates despair. And so he kind of, you know, at this point is against those despair kids, right? Oh, so Nagito's on our side this time, sort of. I mean, he'd still be against, like, Komaru and people without talent, but I think it would be sort of like um, how he kind of comes to an, a resolution with Hajime, where he's like, well, if hope can develop even in something, someone as insignificant as you, I suppose that's something. <laughs> but he'd be mostly focused on trying to get Toko to like achieve ultimate hope to her great annoyance. Um, but yeah, the final act like turn of their personality makes a lot more sense if it's Nagito because that's what Nagito does. <laughs> he doesn't really like. You expect it. Right? You're like, oh, he's being really nice to us. This this doesn't seem right. He's going to he's evil in the game that comes sequentially after this in canon. Something's gonna happen. And of course at the very end, he would side with the mastermind behind everything. Um, which spoiler alert isn't Monica. <laughs> but we will get to that when we talk about Monica. Um but yes, he'd have a sudden change of heart and he'd betray the group and they'd all be like, Oh come on, Nagito. Um, so he'd essentially be the traitor of this game, like the Chiaki, or Chiaki's the, a bad choice, the Sakura of the, the game, almost. Um, so yeah. This is the first big one. This is the one that I connected immediately that made me think that I should look into this more, and that is Kaido and Kenshiro. Um, so the weird thing about Kaido is that he has an illness that never really gets explained. Um, Samugi says, oh yeah, I gave it to him for the drama. But like, <laughs> you're purposefully sabotaging your own killing game then. Because if he's gonna die outside the killing game, you've literally just lost one potential member for your game. And that's no good. <laughs> um, but, so, they both correlate in the fact that they both have this debilitating illness, right? And also that they're both strong. Um, Kaido is shown, like, they put a lot of emphasis on Kaido being strong. Like, he goes to punch Kokichi at certain points. And then, when his illness has progressed far enough, the thing that gives it away is that he's not able to punch Kokichi. Kokichi's, like, flips him or whatever, right? 
And that makes a lot more sense if the dude we're talking about is, like, the ultimate martial artist. I know Sakura is the ultimate martial artist, but this dude could beat her in a fight. He's the only dude who ever could. Um, at his best. And, of course, he's not at his best right now. But he would, of course, realize immediately going to this killing game that, huh, I've got this illness. I don't know how long I got left. My life is not as important as the rest of these people's. So he'd be putting everything on the line to try to save them, because why not? <laughs> he, he's got nothing to lose, essentially. So, like, when Kaido rushes into danger at the beginning all the time, it would make a lot more sense if that was Kenshiro. Um, also, I do think, given his relationship with Sakura and how Sakura talks about him as being, like, this kind-hearted dude, that him, like, seeking out to help people does make sense um in the same way as kaido does where it's kind of like i'm gonna help you whether you like it or not <laughs> you know um so yeah i think they they match up like really well it's surprising um and that was the one that made me start on this whole thing so <laughs> we'll see where that goes so this one is also very important maybe only second to kenshiro because kokichi makes so much more sense if he is Takaki Ishimaru. Um, now, just a little introduction on Takaki Ishimaru, because he's not as um, <laughs> as known as the rest of the people we've talked about so far, right? He's one of the first ones that is like exclusively a hit list target and doesn't get referenced outside of it. Um, Takaki Ishimaru is a cop. He is Taka's father. Um, and the thing says he's got like a harsh sense of justice um and he's willing to shoot the children like not just the despaired kids like the warriors of hope he's willing to shoot the monokuma kids in order to get out of there alive um so much like kokichi he's willing to end the killing game by any means possible um and yes that essentially correlates into them both being exceptionally paranoid of the people around them. Um, and so, <laughs> skipping by the second point, because I already talked about it, he has an actual reason to discover that Toko is a murderer. Kokichi's is due to circumstances from the killing game, and it's kind of, it's it's there, like it, it exists, but it, it feels kind of forced, right? <laughs> um, he breaks into everybody's rooms, he's this super important person suddenly. Um, but if Takaki sees Toko, He's a cop. They've been searching for Genocide Jack for a long time. And there's a good chance, given what they were talking about, like, they had a whole profile on what she what she should be. They were, like, almost to figuring her out before the tragedy. They knew that given the way the murders were committed and when they were, that it was most likely the killer was a school, like, a school person and probably a girl. Um... So, him putting together that Toko might be Genocide Jack and just ousting her after the second case, that actually makes a lot of sense. And that actually would have been kind of cool, right? <laughs> like, oh, this dude actually figured that out. Oh, he's actually, like, a force to be reckoned with. It would make him feel a lot more intimidating than, you know, Kokichi just watching a video. <laughs> Like a YouTube tutorial on how to discover assassins. <laughs> anyway, the other thing Kokichi has that doesn't really make sense is his evidence room. Um, so you could just explain that away as, oh, he's paranoid, of course. He's trying to connect the dots. He's trying to figure this all out. But it would also make a lot more sense if he was a cop with an evidence room, right? Using his room to collect evidence and make profiles on the characters to try to figure out who's trustworthy or not sounds a lot more like something a cop would be doing than a supreme leader. <laughs> Even if he isn't actually a supreme leader, he's like a, a noble thief or whatever. That's Kokichi's role, essentially. Um, it still makes way more sense if it's a cop that's doing it. Um, and Takaki would be very, very important as like the Byakuya of this killing game. He would oppose Kamaru, who's willing to work with Toko, even though she's a murderer. Um, he would oppose, like, any mercy given to the killers in the class trials. He would oppose all of that. He's like, uh, hypercritical Taka, almost. <laughs> so yeah, that's a cool character. I'm sad we never got to see it. Okay, 
So I've got less points for this one on the board because it's kind of hard to explain it in short form. So I'm going to long form it to you right now. So Shuichi and Fuhito Kirigiri. Um, so Fuhito Kirigiri, he's also a little bit more well known. Like he, he has appearances outside the hit list. He is Kyoko's grandfather and he is one of the premier detectives of the... I think it's called the Detective Something Guild? You know, from Danganronpa Kirigiri. That one. <laughs> Um, so this dude was the dude that essentially convinced Kyoko to hate her father because her father wouldn't become a detective. Um, and he hates his, uh, Jin hates him right back because he didn't give any, like, care or attention to the fact that his wife had died. He was like, get over it, become a detective, come on, <laughs> give me your grand, give me my granddaughter so I can force her to be a detective. So he's described as kind. And, like, a, sort of a gentle person, but he's also, like, obviously very emotionally manipulative to Kyoko and the people he takes under his wing. And that's kind of a cool character trait, too. Um, this also explains why V3 has duplicated ultimates. Why we have two ultimate detectives now. Because uh, he's a detective. <laughs> you can't write... Um, or you can't replace Fujito's character with someone who isn't a detective. It wouldn't make sense. Um, it also makes a lot more sense of the fact that he would be taking someone under his wing. Um, like, Shuichi and Kaede start working together for, like, literally just because they like each other. Which, you know what? That was a good enough character arc for them. But it's a little bit cooler if <laughs> it's Fujito who's like, Well, I'm going to... You seem to have decent intuition. You can be my understudy. And he's trying to solve the entire thing. I also think it makes a lot more sense for Fujito to set up the trap to try to kill the mastermind. Um, in V3, it is, of course, Kaede who sets said trap with Shuichi's information. Because Shuichi is basically acting in the role of Komaru, <laughs> even though Kaede is also acting in the role of Komaru. It's just sort of a weird coincidence thing that's happening because they're both basically sharing the role of one character uh, for that first case. Um, but to me, it would make a lot more sense if the person who figured it all out actually planned the murder to kill them. Just saying. Um, so yeah, essentially you'd have like a first chapter where Fujito is taking Komaru under his wing and training her in the art of being a detective. Um, and the sort of climax of that first arc of her not wanting to reveal the truth is that this dude who's been mentoring her <laughs> just killed the guy and is about to get executed for it. So yeah. Okay. So next up is Kibo and Taichi Fujisaki. Uh, Taichi is somewhat of a main character in Ultra Despair Girls. He's at least featured as an actual character you can meet. Um, but the reason I connect them both is obviously they're both tech, like they're both tech geniuses. <laughs> um, Kibo because he literally is technology, and uh, Tai Chi because he's like a computer programmer, just like Chihiro. Um, the thing that connects them probably a bit stronger than that though is the fact that it's mentioned in Tai Chi's like description um, that he doesn't he's not very strong. Like he's smart, but he's not very strong. And for Kibo, it's almost the exact same thing. <laughs> Kibo is smart, and he should be strong. He's a robot, after all. But they make a point of saying, oh yeah, I was programmed to be no stronger than the average elderly man. And it's like a little side joke, like a ha 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 ha, yeah, because some robot did something bad, and so they, they toned down the strength of the robots. But it could also just be a cover for the fact that he was originally Tai Chi, <laughs> who's someone who's not strong. Um, the third point I have here, the connection to the outside world, it's referring to Kibo's sort of like antenna and his connection to the audience who are basically influencing his decisions. That's not exactly the same for Tai Chi, obviously. He doesn't have an antenna that will be... <laughs> <laughs> making him the audience surrogate. Instead, what I thought of is maybe the kids need him. Like, if they were making, like, a Neo World program, like, their their goal was to essentially find a perfect vessel for the new AI Junko 
to like go into. Um, it would maybe it would make sense to do a killing game. Maybe that's why in Ultra Despair Girls there's such a focus on um, Komaru. <laughs> They're like, oh, perfect. She's like a young girl and she's got a lot of like spunk. <laughs> maybe she'll be the perfect vessel for AI Junko. Um, and so they'd have Taichi essentially working on his son's old work of making this Neo World program or the d hope restoration, despair restoration program thing. And it would be neat because it would essentially be Taichi thinking he's working with his son, like who's like captured somewhere, when in reality he's working with Alter Ego. Um, and so he would basically have to, he would be like almost a second traitor. He would be forced to work with the masterminds because if he does, he like he's <laughs> being threatened with the death of his son, who is actually unfortunately already dead. But he he's talking to Alter Ego um, inside like the Neo World program, and that would be the same Alter Ego we see in SDR two. So yeah, maybe when that Alter Ego is talking about his father, more context to that. We thought he was talking about Chihiro because Chihiro made him, but maybe he's talking about Taichi because Taichi keeps calling him his son when he's working on it. Oh, that's sad, but it's also a good plot point. Next up is Aloysius Pennyworth. Um, so this guy wasn't really important in Ultra Despair Girls either, but he is Byakuya's butler. And in fact, the only person Byakuya ever really opens up to, <laughs> um, which makes him, of course, the most important person in Byakuya's life. Um, they are both... He, sorry, he matches up mostly with Kirumi. Um, she's a maid, he's a butler. That's a pretty obvious comparison. Um, but they both are like this sort of like stoic servant person. Um, in Aloysius's like character description, it says he's gruff. But it's sort of the same deal, right? Like they serve people, they don't really like talk to the rest of the group as like they're equals they're kind of like separate from the rest of the group they feel that way um and the second point i know <laughs> is probably drawing your attention yes aloysius actually has reason to maybe be behind running the country it always felt weird that kurumi would be in that role like yeah she's a maid but that doesn't mean she knows how to run the government um it was kind of like almost played for laughs again just like kibo's strength that, you know, she's so good at doing any task she's assigned that she just figured it out. Um, but for Aloysius, it actually makes some sense. Because he serves, what, the most important family in all of Japan? The Togami clan is said to have... They do. Byakuya tells us that they have hands in pockets all over Japan. And that they are, like, somewhat in control of the country. So... Perhaps they don't want to do all the busy work of trying to do all that junk, and instead, they let their loyal servant do it for them. And so, Aloysius would actually be somewhat responsible for running the country. Um, and maybe his reasoning for escaping isn't exactly the same as Kurumi. Kurumi just wants to get out because I gotta save the entire country. Aloysius, that would be a factor in his escape, but it would also be to try to find Byakuya and help the Togami clan, right? So it'd be a little bit more personal, and it'd feel a little bit less soulless and empty. <laughs> Next up, Kanon, not Kanon Kawada, I always think it is, it's Kanon Nakajima, because they're, she's uh, Leon's cousin, she's not actually, like, related to him directly, um, and Kurekyo Shinguji. So... <laughs> These two don't really relate too much, aside from the fact that they have a <clears throat> fascination with a family member. Uh, Canon is in love with Leon, um, in the same way that Kurekyo is in love with his sister. So they don't really have much in common outside of that. It's just that that's a really strange like plot point to give to two characters. Like, ooh, it's a little bit less weird in canon's case but only because it's like one separate degree removed from being literally like brother and sister <laughs> it's still weird though obviously um i think if anything canon would actually act more like junko um like mukro junko <laughs> like she'd be like the sassy like uh i'm so rich and famous type of person because it's like 
it said that once Leon turned her down, she started like changing the way she dressed and the way she acted to try to be more like someone Leon might fall in love with. Um, and so like looking at the way she's dressed and the like the sort of attitude she's giving off even in this one um, image, she does kind of remind me of Junko in a lot of ways. And it would be kind of interesting to see like, oh yeah, Junko is my hero. And then suddenly she comes out and realizes, oh, Junko destroyed the world. Wow, that sucks. <laughs> She'd also be kind of like uh, Kazuichi, where she's like dressed up in this like fancy, rich, not rich, fancy sort of like popular girl clothes. But in reality, she's just like, just a random girl. She doesn't really get all of this, but she's doing, she's putting on a show for everybody, right? In the same way that Karekio is putting on a show is like a normal person. <laughs> Because Karekio is not a normal person. Um, that's pretty much it, though. I don't see her really doing any of the things that Karekio does, other than being somewhat creepy sometimes, maybe. Um, just for the fact that she is in love with her cousin and, used, and like, idolized Junko and sort of does the same, like, personality quirks that Junko does... That'd be kind of creepy for the player. It wouldn't be so creepy just generally like Kurekyo does. <laughs> so next up, I want to talk about Fujiko... Oh no, Yamada. It's gotta be Yamada. Because um, she is Hifumi's sister. Um, so, I think some people know a little bit about this character because I got comments about like her when I, was, <laughs> I posted that uh, teaser earlier. Um, she actually went through a major personality shift in the transition between demo, like beta design content, and then final Ultra Despair Girls content. Her original personality was somewhat more like Muse, where she was super perverted all the time, and she was kind of like, but I wish I had the quote. I'll put it on screen. This is the quote from the website. Yeah, that's what she was going to be like. And if that doesn't sound like Mew, I don't know what does, honestly. Um, it would make a lot of sense, actually, for them to be in the same role, especially if Kibo was not a robot. Because part of what Mew does is basically <laughs> fix Kibo. Um, she wouldn't have to have that role in this one. She didn't have to be the ultimate inventor. She could just be Fujiko and draw dudes with rippling muscles because that's what she does and also really like intricate food that makes people hungry so <laughs> you know that's that's who she is um they would fill the same like character trope though is what i'm saying even if like muse definitely more helpful in the grand scheme of things they would both be like the person who just shouts out random sexual innuendo innuendos during a trial and is kind of mean to people, but then as soon as you call her on it, she turns into like, you know, docile Mew, if you want to call it that, where she's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. So yeah. Next on the list is Angie Yonaga and <laughs> Ayaka Haniyama. So, you might notice Ayaka doesn't have a beta sprite for me to use. That's because originally, um, in the same beta sprite sheet as the rest of these people, uh, they were going to include Sayaka Mizuno's sister. Um, but they cut her from the game because they realized, wait, <laughs> in Danganronpa 1, in Sayaka's free time event, she says, yes, I was, I was so alone. Like, my dad was at work and my mom was gone, so I was always alone after school, and I just watch idol shows, and so eventually that's why I idolized them. But um tsh uh, so if she had a little sister to keep her company, that would kind of ruin that plot point. Um, so instead we have Ayaka Haniyama, which is one of Sayaka's bandmates. So, Ayaka's main character trait is that she's one of basically Sayaka's background dancers, you know? She's part of the group, but she's not one of the more popular members. Um, in that way, she's basically cultivated like a small following, and she clings to them as hard as she can. Um, so when I say she's obsessed, um, where Angie is obsessed with Atua, Ayaka would be obsessed with popularity. Even 
during this killing game, she'd be trying to get people to like recognize her as an idol. Um, and that would lead to the cult that Angie has, which would essentially be Ayaka's fan club almost. Um, she would essentially have like a group of the people in the killing game who would be like, wow, I, I didn't realize you were so cool and like a superstar. I'll do anything for you, you know, like, you know, <laughs> idol fans. Um, and so this would obviously rub the rest of the group the wrong way, <laughs> right? Like, what are you doing? We're in the middle of a killing game. Stop this. You're distracting everyone. You're getting them in a big group and you're making murder easier. Um, so... <laughs> Let's tackle these last two points and uh, be done here. Um, oh yeah, both are artists, obviously. Um, Angie's an actual, like, literal artist, where Ayaka is a, a singer, so she's an artist in that way. Um, so here's a quote from the website. I actually put one on the thing. Look at me go. Uh, let me click off my OBS so I can read it for you. Both are easily irritated and super... Or, <laughs> this is about Ayaka, actually. Um, she is easily irritated and quote-unquote super crazy however it's noted that this side of her is kind of cute which you know what <laughs> that sounds like angie to me <laughs> super crazy but even when she's saying the like worst things ever she still looks super cute doing it that's angie and then finally they're both kind of cunning angie's cunning is kind of incidental i think i don't think she really means to be cunning she <laughs> she just thinks like a tua this is a tua's will and so i will do it and it ends up, like, deceiving people to believe in Atua and all that junk. Um, whereas Ayaka would be literally cunning. She would be trying to manipulate people into liking her and being her wackies, essentially. So, yeah. Kind of like a Celeste, honestly. Next up is the weakest connection on the board. So, this was actually the last ones I matched up because they didn't really match up that well. Uh, Gonta and Hiroko Hagakure, um, the only really thing they have in common is that both want to protect the group. Both want to protect everyone. Um, I didn't even know this. Like, I played through the game and I didn't even know this, but Hiroko is actually a nurse. Um, so she'd actually be <laughs> kind of a lot more helpful than Gonta when it came to protecting people. Like, she could be able to help, uh, Kokichi, quote-unquote, when he smashes his head. Or when Kaido is sick, she might be able to diagnose his illness or something like that. Um, but, yeah, they don't really share much aside from that. Like, they just want to protect everybody. That's their role in the story. I really don't see Hiroko going down the same path as Gonta when it comes to, like, Case 4, for example. So, I like, I'd like to think that some of the cases were completely re rewritten when we were doing it, when they switched to V3 from, like, this Danganronpa 3 that never was. Um, because some of the cases fit really well, and some of them just do not. So, <laughs> we'll go over that after I do finish the character. So, we've gotten to the cat. <laughs> Everybody was interested in how the cat was going to play out, and the cat would essentially fill the role of Himiko. Uh, a lazy, prideful cat. <laughs> Who just, like, just there. Um, a lot of my criticism of Himiko's character arc is that she actually has a character arc, and then the character arc doesn't actually end up doing anything. She's like, I'm not gonna be lazy anymore, I'm gonna give him my all, and for like the next two scenes she does, and then after that she's just Himiko again. So for a cat, that would be a lot less of a problem, because <laughs> the cat wouldn't even really realize it. The cat might be sad after Angie, or uh, Ayaka, and spoiler alert, Yuki are gone. Yuki? Oh no, that's draw <laughs> Yuda. <laughs> After Ayaka and Yuda are gone, because like, you know, those were the two people paying the most attention to him. But he's still a cat, so <laughs> like nothing big is gonna happen. Um also because it's a cat, it actually makes a lot more sense of t uh like a Tanko Angie type feud. Because the weird thing about it is like Himiko is given no agency in their feud. Like, yeah, she decides to sit with Angie, but she never, like, talks to Tanko or says why, right? <laughs> um, 
if it's a cat, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> the cat just likes Ayaka better, and Yuda is just mad about it. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly don't see Case 3 going the same way as it does in V3, but the role of Himiko and Sherry uh, Ludenberg would be much the same. Also, one last note on Cherie. Um, Himiko's a survivor, right? Like, the final three survivors are Shuichi, Maki, and Himiko. Um, with Tsumugi obviously being a mastermind and Kibo blowing himself up. So, that would leave us with Komaru, Toko, and the cat. So the ending from Alter Despair Girls of just those two girls basically staying in the city it could be the exact same thing because the cat obviously doesn't influence it at all it's literally just Komaru and Toko again so yeah I thought that was interesting okay this one's a good one so Rantaro and Haiji um this is one of the cases that I think just fits it fits really well with these characters from v3 um because the first case, of course, has Rantaro being killed by Kaede, um, and he has all this extra information because he's the ultimate survivor. In this alternate version, Rantaro would be replaced instead with Haiji. Haiji wouldn't tell the group that he was Toa. He wouldn't tell the group that he was from Toa. He would just say, my name's Haiji. They wouldn't know anything about him. He'd essentially be the ultimate question mark, question mark, question mark, just like Rantaro. Um, they both have information the group needs. Haiji knows about Toa. He knows Monica, and he knows that Monica's doing this. He doesn't tell the group because that would ruin his family name, right? If he can get out of this without telling the group that Monica is related to him, he is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, however, I think the reason that Monica would have to kill him, because Monica is standing in place of Samugi in this case, the reason Monica would have to kill him, um, even if Fujito's trap failed would be that he was basically saying he was going to expose monica as like a toa family member he was gonna tell the group everything um and so monica needed to silence him and thus the plot was sort of contrived um so that's the group information the group needs point both come off as creepy it's true when I first played through V3 and I was talking to Rantaro, I got, like, really bad vibes. I thought he was evil for sure. In fact, when he wasn't evil at the end, I was surprised. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? Oh, now I just feel bad because I assumed he was evil this whole time. Um, and Haiji, he gives off the same vibes. Like, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a Toa dude. I'm, I'm cool, though. I'm helping all these adults escape. But you're like, there's something to this guy. I don't like the way he's looking at me. <laughs> so yeah, they both go off the same creepy vibes. And of course, I already talked about it, but they both have a reason for the mastermind to kill them. Um, which is, of course, their information. And in Haiji's case, to silence him. Okay, this one's minorly weak as well. Also, I have an extra hyphen. <laughs> don't, don't look at it. <laughs> but uh, Takemichi, I can't remember his last name. Yukiharu? Something like that. Um, he is Mondo's bodyguard. He's said to be like the um, the cool-headed sort of advisor to Mondo's hot-headed uh, aggression. Um, so, you, you know, like, <laughs> without him, Mondo ends up doing what Mondo does in Trigger Happy Havoc. So he's, like, really important to Mondo. Also, you know what that means? It's a gang tie, right? He's part of a gang. Um, and... Ryoma is known for murdering a gang. <laughs> so that's one little connection. It would also make sense for Takemichi to think that everybody he knew was dead. He could have seen the um, Monokuma despair followers, whoever came and kidnapped these people, murder all the gang members, like the biker gang members of Crazy Diamond, and had been like, damn, I could do nothing to stop that, and they took Mondo. Like, that was the person I was supposed to be guarding. Um, and so, it would also sort of make sense for him to want to give up his own life. He is a bodyguard by trade, after all. He's someone who's obviously used to that sort of um, reality. Uh, 
it could be that he's basically like, well, if y if there was like a first blood perk thing, it's reasonable to think you would say, look, like the entire gang is done. I have no idea if Mondo's alive. Kill me, go out and try to save everyone. Like save all the family members that are trapped in that other thing. Essentially, the way I see this killing game is it would be essentially the Despair Kids saying the exact same thing Junko said. Instead of it being Junko saying, look, all of your family members, like Komaru, are trapped and I have them and I'll kill them if you don't do it. The, it would be the opposite where they'd have all the family members and the kids would be saying, look, we've got all the ultimate students. They're trapped in Hope Speak Academy and we will kill them if you don't obey us. Um... Because, of course, these guys wouldn't know what happened in the killing game. Toko would, but Toko would be just like Toko and Ultra Despair Girls and not want to give them any information. Um, <laughs> because, god damn it, Toko. Um, but yeah, they're both short. That's the, the biggest thing that made me look into it more. They're both short. They're like the short character. And notably, <laughs> in his character description, it says um, that he has spiky hair that sticks up from the front. Which I don't really see on this beta design, but maybe in the final one. Um, and the most notable feature on Ryoma's head is those two spikes. It's pretty loose, but it's something. I had to say it just because it it made me think, <laughs> that's a funny coincidence. Anyway, yeah, these two would be basically the same role. Okay, next up we have Tanko and Yuda. So, Aside from the men-hating thing, Tenko and Yuda are very similar. <laughs> um, they're both athletes, obviously. Um, Tenko is, of course, an actual martial artist, essentially. Um, whereas Yuda is, like, a... You see a track and field dude? Can't remember what he does. He might also be a, a runner, I think. But he's also decent at swimming. So you know what? <laughs> he's just an all-around athlete. Um, but both are, like, pretty, like, hopeful and pretty understanding because you know how tanko has those weird moments that go completely against the rest of her character where she just looks at himiko and goes huh now that i fought you i know exactly how you're feeling it's okay like that like empathy yeah that would be yuda <laughs> that would be yuda in the situation he'd be he'd be like no none of you guys are bad dudes no i want to help you all out um and i think don't quote me on this, but I think the case two in this one would actually be the death of Yuda. Um, case one is, of course, Haiji. Um, but Yuda makes way more sense as, like, the heart of the group. And he dies early in Ultra Despair Girls, too. Um, technically, he's the second execution, because the first one is Komaru, even though it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah... It would be a little bit different than Tanko, but they essentially fill the same character role, just like a couple of these other ones. Okay, now we're getting to the fun bit. So, Monokuma wouldn't be in this game. Um, instead, the role of Monokuma and Monami from Super Danganronpa 2 would essentially be filled by Kurakuma and Shirakuma. Shirakuma would be like Monami, he'd be popping up all over the place trying to help the, the group escape or help them with anything that he can. Whereas Kurakuma would be just like Monokuma, constantly beating up on Shirakuma, calling him worthless, that kind of a thing. Um, and also being sort of the mentor to the kids. So, where Monokuma sits, these two would be essentially where that is. Um, also, they're kind of important because they lead the participants to think that there is someone, like, actually in control of the killing game, aside from the kids. Um, because it, it would be pretty understandable to think, if you're faced with five psycho children, that <laughs> they're actually not the ones behind everything. That there's some adult pulling the strings and, like, forcing these kids to do bad things. Wow, I didn't mean to rhyme that, but and there we go. Um... <laughs> So Kurakuma and Shirakuma would essentially give people, give the participants rather, the thought that there's someone else behind the scenes. Which is important because, or else they wouldn't think someone in the group was betraying them and there would be no reason for case number one to happen. But we will of course get to that later. Oh, also I forgot to mention it, but Shirakuma would definitely take um, Kibo's place in blowing themselves up at the end, just like they do in Ultra Despair Girls, to help the group escape. Yeah. And now we get to the big one. And you can see by how much text is here that this is a big one. 
So, the Mono Cubs and the Warriors of Hope are so similar conceptually. They both, one dies after every case slash chapter in both. Pretty much. Like, there's two at the end, but that's just like Kotoko and Monica. Um, they all, they run the killing game and they make mistakes. Like, that happens in Ultra Despair Girls 2. Um, they're all copying Big Sis Junko. In V3, Samugi is copycatting Junko. And in this one, it's the same thing. So, these, these Kumas and these kids essentially play the exact same role. Um, they'd be the ones going out in the Exisals, which, damn, the Exisals are just the Warrior of Hope robots, aren't they? Wow, didn't really think about that, but yeah, yeah, they are. Um, <laughs> they'd be going out in the robots and enforcing the, the rules, um, and maybe they'd just be showing up at times, right? They wouldn't be, like, popping out like the Kumas do, because Kurakuma and Shirakuma would, of course, be doing that. But maybe Kurakuma disappears for a chapter, just like in V3 when Monokuma disappears for a chapter. And so the kids are left to run the killing game entirely on their own, and it doesn't go so well. Hey. Also, their personalities match up somewhat. It's a lot less concrete than I'd, I'd want, but I'm going to go through it anyway. So, the first one to die, of course, um, in both is Monokid and Masaru. Um... They are both loud and sort of self-absorbed. Uh, Masaru less so, but he is like, Yeah, I'm the leader, I'm the best, shut up, Nagisa! Um, so yeah, they, they relate in that way. Um, Monosuke and Nagisa both are focused on the end goal. Of course, in Monosuke's case, it's about making money off of merch, because <laughs> it's a TV show they're running, after all. Um... In Nagisa's case, it's about creating this hopeful future for kids. Um, which, of course, the killing game would be a distraction from, <laughs> right? It would be the exact same thing as the, like, killing whatever. I don't even, I don't remember what they call it in Ultra Despair Girls. The hunt, whatever, where they're hunting down these people. It would be, he would be opposed to it because he'd be like, this isn't, we like, we took Toa City. Now it's time to build up our kids' paradise. What are you guys doing? And so, yeah. It would actually almost make more sense for Nagisa to, to die second, but, you know. Uh, next up is Monodom and Jotaro. So they are both the bullied one. Um, I also think it would be kind of neat for Jotaro to, like, take control for a chapter and, like, try to be the leader after Nagisa and Masaru are gone. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, right? And then he realizes that he can't do it, and, you know, same fate as uh, Monodom. Uh, next is Monofani and Kotoko. Girl. That's pretty much it. Monofani's entire personality is just, I am girl. And so Kotoko would fill that role. Um, of course, in this case, we have two girls in the group. But Monica is kind of separate from the rest of the Warriors of Hope. So Monofani and Kotoko essentially do the same thing. With, like, that final plot where... Um, Essentially, Monotaro and Monofani are playing house or whatever, like a really weird, corrupted version of house, where they're like being like, oh, I'm the wife, and oh, I'm the father, and oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> that weird thing. Those those theaters work really well for the kids. Can you imagine like a, a Monokuma theater featuring Jotaro, where you see the creepy like marionette corpses? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> And then finally, Monotaro and Monica. They are the actual leader, even though they don't really, like, super vie for the position like <laughs> the others do. Um, and where Monotaro has his forgetfulness, that people are always like, oh, poor Monotaro, he's so forgetful, blah, blah, blah. Of course, Monica would have her wheelchair. Where it's like, oh, poor Monica, such bad things happen to her. We have to, we have to help her. That sort of thing. Also, we'll get to Monica in a second. Okay, so real fast, I want to list off some of the other similarities I just encountered while I was thinking about this, um, in no particular order or anything. We already talked about the Exisals and the Warrior of Hope robots essentially serving the exact same purpose. Um, there is a cosplay mastermind. Smoogie is the ultimate cosplayer, but of course we see Monica cosplaying as Junko in the anime. 
Wow. Didn't really think about that until just a couple seconds ago, honestly. Um, there's the ruined outside world, which of course, that's always a factor in Danganronpa games. The secret exit. So, um, that little platforming minigame in V3, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, basically, it's important later, but it kind of just, it's weird, right? It, it happens in the first case, and you're like, what is going on? But, the secret exit in the shrine in Ultra Despair Girls could serve the exact same purpose. It being blocked off at the end with some sort of door. Um, next is the Monokuma Army. So, Mother Kuma in V3 is capable of creating this Monokuma army to, like, wipe out all the students if they don't start the killing game. Um, that's, like, their motive in case one. And damn, <laughs> they have a Monokuma army in um, Toa City. That's what the entirety of, like, Ultra Despair Girls is about. So that's, like, really similar. The idea that, like, there's this Monokuma army raging around everywhere, um... And that if they do not kill, then that army will just descend on them and murder them all. Um, also, they could find Mother Kuma in like the Toa factory buildings or something. It would be really kind of more fitting than just a random room in a school. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about the labs. Because the labs are also kind of weird. They don't really do much, right? They basically just provide the students with a bunch of props for the murder cases. Um, Chuichi's poison, Muse, like, robot parts, and Kibos. Um, so, similarly, there are buildings around Toa City that would function sort of the same way as labs. There's a library where Fujito might do research. Um, there's a police station where, like, uh, what's his name? Takaki might find files on Genocide Jack. All this kind of stuff. And the labs would essentially just be stores and buildings and public services. So yeah. Now we're getting into the final part. This part is what I've got less notes on. Um, but I want to talk about the ending. So, how would this killing game end? It couldn't end the same way as Ultra Despair Girls, right? Um, <clears throat> but I want to say that it would be very similar. It definitely wouldn't be like V3, though. <laughs> so the ending of this Killy game would see Toko, Komaru, Nagito, Taichi, and Sherry Boas Ludenberg as the final survivors. If they, we followed V3 exactly, which I don't think we would. Um, and... It would see them going up against A, Monica, after they defeat Monica as, like, the first act, um, in the same way you defeat Samugi in the first act of the final trial, and then you kind of have to defeat Danganronpa. Um, they would defeat Samugi in the first, or, sorry, Monica in the first act, and then who should arrive but Izuru Kamakura. Something that bugged me about Ultra Despair Girls is they show Izuru, but you never see him. You never talk to him. It would be the perfect time to develop Izuru as a character. And wow, that would be like a killer ending, right? Because you gotta you gotta acknowledge that the fact that this would be the third game. So if we were like progressing in terms of seriousness, the, the second game ends with essentially the death of Alter Ego Junko. And sort of the end of the ultimate despairs. Because they've decided to, you know, be reformed. Um, and so this one would actually be the climactic moment. This Toa City conflict would be the final battle with despair. Um, technically that's in DR2. But this would be the actual battle with the ultimate despairs themselves. Izuru doesn't come alone. He comes with backup. I don't know who he would bring, but definitely Kazuichi, because he's probably in the city already working on the Monokuma robots. Why wouldn't he be? Um, but this would see the final clash between hope and despair with the rest of the hit list targets in the middle of it. You'd have Toko and Kamaru on one side. The cats, just nothing. But Taichi would have to side with the masterminds, or with the despair people, because, you know, his son is on the line and he's not willing to risk that. But for Kamaro, it's easy. Her brother shows up. Future Foundation shows up 
to try to defeat the ultimate despairs that are left and coming for whoever's left. Um, of course, the catalyst for this battle is the fact that Monica is defeated. As soon as Monica is defeated, all the pressure that is on Future Foundation not to show up because of Byakuya is dispelled. They don't have to worry about that anymore. So they rush into the city. We see, like, I don't know if it'd be everyone, but we see the kids from Danganronpa 1. And they show up to the trial, as well as an equal number of despairs <clears throat> to oppose them, along with Izuru. And of course, Nagito and Taichi would have to side with the, de with the despairs, because, of course, Nagito is going to follow anything Izuru does. Izuru is like the ultimate ultimate. He is fascinated entirely with Izuru as soon as he sees him. Um, and so it's a split decision. And oh, it's the perfect ending to the new feature featured in this third game, the scrum debate. A final scrum debate between hope and despair to try to convince Taichi to leave them and try to finish despair off once and for all it would be it'd be such a cool way to integrate this new mechanic for the final battle um and so in the end we'd have future foundation winning of course um this final trial and capturing the ultimate despairs of the thing including izuru and nagito who would of course end up on a boat <laughs> later that evening talking about, you know, whatever to each other, about the rotten arms and junk. And we would have the perfect impetus for Izuru to have the two pieces of Alter Eco Junko to be captured by Future Foundation. It would be just an, a smooth transition directly into SDR2 after that. So yeah, that would be the ending. A final battle between hope and despair with the hitless targets caught in the middle um with the final scrum debate it's so good i can't believe it's not real but now we're going to talk about that so why do i think that this game was real and isn't act didn't actually end up getting made well the reason i think it was a real script at some point is obviously all these things that fit but also in the, I know this isn't the best source, but the fandom description of V3, in an interview, um, one of the creators said that there was sort of a divide between the studio. Half of them wanted to make something completely original and new, while half of them wanted to make a game like the two before, when making V3. <laughs> what if that translates into, half of them wanted to make an entirely new game, while the other half really wanted to reuse these ideas from this scrapped script of the, that eventually morphed into Alter Despair Girls. And that's why all these weird things happen in V3, because they're trying to insert this old script that doesn't actually like fit with these characters exactly into V3 from this existing one that we're talking about now. I do acknowledge, though, that Danganronpa just does the same thing over and over a lot of the time. So maybe all of this is literally just coincidence. Like they're literally, they were literally like, I like that idea. Let's do that again. <laughs> um, however, the reasons this game would have been, this script would have been scrapped in the first place. There's actually a lot. One child death <laughs> in Ultra Despair Girls. It's a little bit ambiguous. And of course the anime makes sure that they survive. Um, two, no ultimates. I mean, there's Nagito and Toko, but there's no new ultimates. And for people who've played Danganronpa, that would probably be a weird turnoff. They'd be like, wait, there's no ultimates in this game? Ugh, I don't know if I want to play that. It's kind of, what's the point? Um, third, they're not all teenagers. Um, it's kind of important that Danganronpa is made up of mostly teenagers, again, from a marketing standpoint. Because, like, who's going to want to hang out with Fujito Kirigiri? Not anybody who's new to the series. Maybe people who know about Kyoko and want to find out about her grandfather, but that's about it. Um, also, no Monokuma. You've got Kurakuma and Shirakuma, but no regular Monokuma. They had to include Monokuma in V3 just so that they could have him there. He barely even does anything in that game. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that's probably the reasons this game never came to fruition. It's just because it's too different. 
And so, of course, they adapted the script into the uh, spin-off game, Ultra Despair Girls. Um, which is kind of sad, because when I was talking about this, you could probably notice, I really like some of the character dynamics they've got going on here. And honestly, V3 had a lot of good story elements with just a really bad, like, conclusion. <laughs> to make a, an, anal an analogy. It's like Game of Thrones, right? You're really into it for the first part of it. But as soon as you get near the end, you just it just makes stops making sense, and so you give up on it. Um, and I think this would have been a really cool way to cap off the Danganronpa series instead of the stupid anime we got instead, which I despise. So yeah, that's basically the gist of this video. Um, I'm sure there's more you'd want to question me about. Maybe this was all explained in an interview at some point, and I'm totally wrong. I don't know. I was just drawing connections between <laughs> characters and stuff. So it's a fun thought experiment, if nothing else. Uh, so yeah, tell me down below if you think this would be cool. And if you want to see me do videos on my own made-up cases for this game. Because I have a pretty good idea for a couple. And uh, the final case, of course, would be pretty neat. So yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy, please leave a like and you can subscribe. Of course, if you want to see those other videos and you want to tell me to make them, then you're going to have to subscribe to see them, right? So, stonks. And yeah, I will talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye!